Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is another episode of our virtual talks hosted by the Sharmin and Bijan uh, Musavar Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. Uh, my name is Payman Jaffrey. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at uh, Princeton University, uh, where I conduct research on the political and social history of energy in Iran. And therefore, it is also my distinct pleasure to uh, moderate today's virtual talk, which is actually a book launch of um, Powering Empire, How Coal Made the Middle East and Sparked Global Organization. I'm of course biased, uh, but I'm sure everybody who has read the book and will read the book will agree with me that this is a wonderful book. Um, we think together uh, the energy of history, science and technology, the energy of the Middle East, and also the political and cultural machineries of uh, empire. Uh, it is also, I must say, a very timely book because it addresses one of the main challenges of our time, of course, uh, carbonization, which, uh, of which the book uh, traces the uh, historical uh, entanglements in infrastructures, in politics and cultures that have been shaped by uh, fossil fuels. Uh, so let me introduce to you the author uh, of, of the book, uh, Professor On uh, Barak. Uh, on welcome to our uh, virtual talk. Thanks, Freeman. Um, Professor Barak is a social and cultural historian of science and technology in non-Western settings. He's also currently a senior lecturer at the Department of Middle Eastern and African History at Tel Aviv University. He has a joint PhD in history and Middle Eastern studies from NYU, uh, but he is also, I must say, familiar to our own uh, Princeton University as he was a member of the Princeton Society of Fellows and also a lecturer at the history department from 2009 to 2012, if I, I'm not mistaken, that's correct. Um, so Professor uh, Barak is also a prolific author um, and has published three books that reflect his intellectual uh, trajectory. The first one, uh, Names Without Faces, uh, From Polemics to Flirtation in an Islamic Chat Room, appeared in 2006. His second book is titled On Time, uh, Technology and Temporality in Modern Egypt, which appeared with the University of California Press in 2013. And uh, last March, uh, his newest book, last book uh, that we are going to discuss today, appeared with the same press, uh, titled um, "How uh, Sorry Powering Empire: How Coal Made the Middle East and Sparked Global um, Carbonization." Um, well, in a, in a way, I must say that the title of the book uh, could be a bit of um, misleading in the sense that it is about so much more than than coal. Uh, it it uh, brings in the discussion on uh, animals, uh, human labor, environment. Uh, technologies and infrastructures, and also the politics and cultures that animate them. Uh, but exactly those aspects that are included in this history of coal and energy are the same things that make this book um, innovative uh, and challenge many of the misconceptions that we have about coal and, uh, and energy. I believe some some uh, where in the book, uh, Professor Barak writes, a uh, section against energy. And I think this very much relates to kind of these misconceptions of, of, of energy, which I'm sure he will uh, explain shortly. So uh, Professor Barak, let me uh, start with two very broad questions. Um, what made you write this book? I mean, what is the intellectual setting that you're positioning the book in? Uh, and also what are the main arguments of the, of the book? Um, uh, uh, that, that you have wanted to address. Thanks, Payman, uh, for this opportunity and for your kind words. And it's always a pleasure to be back at Princeton, even via Zoom. Uh, so let me try to take up both these questions together in a mini lecture of sorts to open to start us off. So in the broadest sense, I think the book is an attempt to ask what the humanities in general and what historians, and in particular historians of the Middle East, and contribute to the conversation about the biggest challenge of our era, the challenge of climate change and global warming, a challenge that uh, usually occupies people in the natural sciences and people who are engaged with the present and the future. But as a historian, I was struck by the fact 
that with all the talk about global decarbonization, this is after all the main horizon we should all advance towards if we want to somehow mitigate climate collapse, we have yet to come up with a roadmap for, for, for global carbonization. We have yet to answer the question how the hydrocarbon economy went global. So this is what my book tries to do. It tries to tell this story. It tries actually to take this process, evidence of which are scattered in various archives and uh, subjected to various modes of presentation from various disciplines and to render it into a story um, stemming from the belief that storytelling is indispensable for any political engagement. And I try to tell this story to anchor the story in the Middle East. Uh, Payman, as you more than anybody knows, the Middle East is uh, associated nowadays mainly with oil uh, and with oil extraction in the 20th century. But what I try to show in Empowering Empire is that these extractive impulses and mentalities and, and, uh, and industries stand on the shoulder of another fossil fuel of British coal coming into the region from the British Isles. Uh, and uh, that this fact has uh, various um, implications that, uh, that we want to, uh, to take seriously. Um, so I think this roadmap that I'm proposing, uh, and, and here I'm uh, beginning to approach your second question about, about themes and arguments, uh, this roadmap of global carbonization helps initially to clear out of the way various troubled optics and myths that uh, hold uh, the, or, or kind of uh, constrain, how, constrain how we think about this process of global carbonization without researching it in any, um, in any rigor or depth. And I will put on the table three such interventions or three such uh, optics that I challenge uh, for, for us to discuss later, perhaps. One would be the diffusional model of the history of technology. This is a very familiar uh, misconception. Dipesh Chakrabarty um, encapsulated it with uh, the with sort of uh, statement, first in Europe, then elsewhere. Uh, say the Industrial Revolution. First, it started in the British Isles, then only gradually it kind of travels to the Middle East or the Indian sub subcontinent and so on and so forth. But uh, what I realized as a historian of, of Egypt, say, as someone who's quite familiar with Egypt, even before I uh, began researching this book, was that uh, Egypt develops its coal dependence roughly around the time, uh, very early, by the way, around the 1830s, around the time uh, that uh, Britain develops its own coal addiction and that these processes are interlinked. Uh, the um, development of, of uh, the British coal sector depends on a market in Egypt and elsewhere in the Middle East. And if this is the case, if the Industrial Revolution is a global process, uh, of course, being a global process does not mean that it's homogeneous because obviously the industrialization of, of the British Isles look very different than the industrialization of, of rural Egypt where uh, cotton fields get ever more dependent on uh, uh, steam-based irrigation. But if these processes are nevertheless inter interlinked, then perhaps resources from settings, from spaces that have been under our radar, but have been nonetheless indispensable for this process of global carbonization can tell us a great deal about uh, how to recast and to reconsider our present predicament and, uh, and perhaps these, these settings, these spaces, uh, like the Middle East, have intellectual and social and political and perhaps even theological resources that can help us rethink about both carbonization and decarbonization. So this is one uh, setting or one intervention. The other intervention is the belief in energy regimes and energy transitions. Um, so as the familiar story goes, in pre-modern time, human society is dependent on renewable energies, as we call them today, on the muscles of, uh, of humans and mainly of animals, and on the powers of uh, the wind and the water. But in the end of the, the 18th century or the beginning of the 19th century, uh, with the advent of the age of coal, these are replaced by fossil fuels, first by coal during the 19th century, coal itself according to this story, is replaced by oil in the beginning of the, of the 20th century, 
And by some accounts, we are perhaps in a post-oil moment characterized by renewables or what have you. But this is, of course, a wrong story. Uh, today, or you know, given that today we're in Corona times, um, let's take uh, 2019. In 2019, we combust more coal in total than we have in any prior historical year. Uh, in that sense, we are neck deep inside the coal. And uh, researching the, uh, the, the arrival of coal in the 19th century, I realized that rather than replacing existing energy sources, coal actually only intensifies them. Um, so uh, rather than a story of energy regimes or energy transitions, I have yet to see an energy transition in the sense of leaving an energy source behind. I'm trying to tell a story of intensification. Indeed, we add up, we enrich our fuel basket, but of course we are not transitioning away from anything. And this is of great importance if we want to think about uh, the present and, uh, and the future as well. So this is a second intervention. The third intervention is trying to take issue not only with energy, but with the hegemony of energy itself. Um, and I'm asking in the book, why do we use the master's tools and the master's energies to try and dismantle the master's house? And um, I, I will probably have more to say about this later, but, but an insight that I had after the book went to print was that uh, Oil companies in recent years have rebranded themselves as energy companies, uh, sometimes by investing in renewables. And this is uh, often not just greenwashing. Sometimes it is, but sometimes uh, it is indeed a strategy of diversification, of, of risk management. Uh, and, uh, but, but what it does is create this light of hand that shifts our attention away from the injurious, from the polluting aspect of, of, the, of the materialities of coal and oil and, and natural gas, a way to this abstraction uh, of energy that I argue uh, obfuscates as much as it reveals. So uh, why don't I take these kind of three um, schemes and try to anchor them or demonstrate them uh, with the geography that my book is, uh, is invested in and, and examines. Uh, an access between or, or uh, a corridor, a maritime corridor between uh, two of the key coaling stations of the 19th century in, in Aden and Port Said. Um, and uh, both these settings and the corridor between them offer, I think, a very useful uh, set, a very useful sp space to demonstrate some of these interventions. So I will uh, share, I will share my screen. So this is the cover of the book, by the way. Um, so from the 1820s and onwards, uh, the British are assembling what I call an artificial archipelago of coaling stations or fueling depots, as they call them, uh, that are erected in equal intervals between the British Isles and, and Bombay, as it is called uh, in the 19th century, uh, in Gibraltar, Malta, Alexandria, and then Port Said, Aden, and uh, indeed Bombay. But uh, Sorry, only, uh, on, maybe you can do it on presentation mode uh, so it becomes clearer. Okay. Yeah. Better? Yes, better. Much better. Okay. So, so this is a map of these uh, coaling depots. But uh, if we use the language of, of fueling stations and coaling depot, depots, that is the language of energy and energy sources and, and an, a language that reduces coal only to, ener to, to an energy source alone, we miss some of the important motivations of the architects of the system, uh, one of which is land grab. So uh, certainly in the beginning, in the early years of, uh, of the emergence of this, uh, of this network, Imperial expansion and land, and land grab are much more important than fueling and coaling. Uh, I can give many examples. One would be um, Aden, which is occupied in 1839 by uh, the East India Company, by the British Empire. Um, in the years before that moment, uh, in several, um, several instances during the 1830s, the Ottoman governor of, uh, of Egypt, Mehmet Ali Pasha, proposes to erect at his own expense a coaling station in Aden, 
which the British would, uh, would be able to use freely. He would finance the garrison. And this proposal is flatly rejected because it's clear to everybody that Mehmet Ali Pasha is trying to excuse Egypt's imperial expansion. Uh, Egypt is expanding to Southern Arabia in, in this period. And it is also clear to everybody that the Brits are likewise you, uh, looking for an excuse to, to justify their own um, um, encroachment into the coffee trade uh, around Mecca and, and the fact that they covered Aden's deep, uh, uh, deep water harbor. Uh, and they try to uh, come up with an excuse for their own land grab and imperial expansion. So by using the language of coaling depots and fueling stations and, and, and fuel and energy um, uh, more generally, we very often find ourselves complicit with 19th century imperialist agendas exactly when we should be critical of them. Um, so, um, so this is one aspect where coal and coaling is just an excuse for empire, where energy is actually a foil for empire. Uh, this, by the way, could also be um, an emergence moment for what we call today energy security, a notion that, that we coined um, in the 1970s and we wrongly associate with the world of oil. Uh, but as many things that I show um, uh, to rest on the shoulders of coal um, in, in my book, this is one such example. Uh, let me show the um, expansion of this uh, system of, of um, coaling depots or fueling stations in, uh, in the 19th century. If these maps uh, seem to indicate a horizontal expansion, and if we tend to think of imperial expansion as a horizontal movement, well, this is certainly the case, but um, the process also has quite significant virt uh, vertical uh, dimensions uh, that my book attends to. Uh, you know, uh, we land rats, when we think about the movement of ships, of steamers and, and sail ships and any maritime vessel, we usually tend to think in horizontal terms as, as a movement forward and backward. But uh, mariners, captains, uh, ship owners are as concerned with a vertical moment, with a with a moment with a, with a, with a movement up and down, uh, they're as interested in questions of buoyancy uh, because they know that if their ship is not heavy enough in the water, if it is if it does not have a low enough center of gravity, when it goes to the open sea and is subjected to the lateral forces of the winds and the waves, it might capsize. And for this reason, British and European ships leave the British Isles in ballast with make weight with some stuff that weighs them down in the water. Before the 19th century, this is usually sand or, or uh, shingles or rocks, but for various reasons, like the fact that it clogs river entries, during the 19th century, this cannot persist and um, um, British fleets shift to using coal as ballast. This actually solves the problem of ballast and enables a return trade. So you would have a ship leaving the British Isles in ballast uh, and it would dump its coal in Ukraine in exchange for grains, or in Egypt in exchange for cotton, and uh, sail back home. Um, and ballasting is such an important aspect of coal that by the end of the 19th century, coal represents four-fifths of the entire weight that leaves the British Isles. Um, and, uh, and, and I think, I think this fact uh, demonstrate um, uh, quite strikingly how uh, thinking of coal only as an energy source, how thinking of coal only via its combustion misses other aspects of the story because before becoming a commodity and before becoming an energy, an energy source, coal is just stuff that has mass, that has weight. Uh, and uh, this in fact is chronologically true uh, if we look at the historical access, it's also in the beginning of every of every itinerary of every uh, of every journey of, of a ship that uh, leaves the British Isles. So, as uh, as we begin to see, and as you pointed out, uh, Payman, in your introductory words, my book is again uh, is is indeed a book against energy. Uh, it is a book that tries to take the energy source par excellence that is coal and um, ignore its pulsing energetic heart and attend instead 
to other dimensions that uh, make it significant. Um, you know, uh, we tend to think of, of energy uh, historically as, as a trans-historical entity, as a primordial thing. Indeed, according to the laws of thermodynamics, you cannot destroy energy, you cannot create new energy, the sum of uh, the energy in the universe remains constant. But energy actually as a category, epistemologically, is, is a thing of its time, the 19th century. It's a product of a new discipline in physics, that is thermodynamics, which dates its birth to the 1840s, and quickly uh, spreads or, or uh, launches an epistemological um, imperialism of its own, moving to other fields and other spheres, uh, evolutionary biology, ecology, neoclassical economics, uh, Marxian thinking and the social sciences. So much of our thinking is, is fraught with, with thermodynamics and, and energy. And of course, one cannot ex ex exaggerate the importance of, of the insights of, of the laws of thermodynamics and the insights about the commensurability between heat motion and work that the category of energy allows us. But I think, as I pointed out, it obfuscates as much as it reveals and it obfuscates as exactly these material aspects of, of energy sources that I uh, try to kind of uh, refocus our attention on. Um, so, um, so let's revisit the space between Aden and Port Said and see how this comes into play. So Aden and Port Said are um, good places to think with, uh, especially uh, if we want to demonstrate these processes of intensification instead of energy transition, because um, both places are boom towns uh, in the 19th century. They are not only uh, important coaling stations, but they are places that uh, hardly exist before the advent of coal. This is truer for Port, for Port Said than it is for Aden. Aden has a longer history. But um, if we look at human populations, this is cer certainly uh, the case. We can certainly call them uh, boom towns. Uh, so Port Said has only 150 people in the year 1859, but a decade later in 1869, when the Suez Canal is inaugurated, it already has 10,000 people. And um, a, decade, uh, a decade and a half later, it has doubled that. It has almost 20,000, in the, in the eve of the British occupation of 1882, it has about 20,000 people. Indeed a boom town, uh, but uh, I suggest that uh, that uh, Port Said is, is not only a human boomtown, but also what I call a multi-species boomtown. And to understand what I mean by that, we can go back to the principle of ballasting and make weight uh, and, um, and, and go from there. So as I pointed out, ballasting, um, coal is used for ballasting in the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, but in the second half of the century, as more and more ships move to steam navigations, and as steamers begin to replace sailboats, uh, a ballasting problem rears its head because as ships burn through their coal supplies, they rise in the water sometimes an inch or an inch and a third a day, and this is very dangerous. This requires solutions. And one of the key solutions is water ballasting. It's a contraption that fastens the ship's uh, steam engine to a water pump that sucks in uh, seawater to compensate for the coal that is lost during uh, steam navigation. Um, water ballasting indeed solves the problem of, of, uh, of buoyancy, but in turn it creates its own set of problems. Today we recognize water ballasting as the key marine uh, pollution vector because what you basically do is suck up water from one part of the ocean with the marine biosha, the zoo, the phytoplankton, you store it in your ship's water tanks and you dump it in the ship's port of coal. Um, and indeed, this creates uh, quite surprising outcomes. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, this principle of water ballasting um, creates a, a vibrant fishery in Port Said. Um, and this is quite striking because we, we're used to thinking of, of fossil fuels in the context of the sixth math, ma mass extinction. The, the dramatic reduction of biodiversity, but in the beginning of the process, and actually as we see now in these days of corona, also today, right, today we live amidst this kind of planetary conveyor belt that, that uh, moves pathogens from, from Wuhan to, uh, to Amsterdam and Princeton and Tel Aviv. Uh, 
but certainly in the beginning of the process, we see that it is characterized by the arrival of invading species uh, from one part of, uh, of the sea to another. Uh, and uh, in, in Port Said, the process of water ballasting actually is linked to another process which marine, marine biologists call uh, Lesepsian migration after Ferdinand de Lesep, the, the founder of the Suez Canal. You know, the Suez Canal not only removes a physical barrier between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean, it also standardizes the salinity and the temperature of the water of these two seas. And this allows a migration of invading species from the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean. Uh, and both these processes actually create a very vibrant fishery. You have fish, uh, and uh, catching them uh, sustains the growth of human population. The fish attract water birds, um, ducks and pelicans and storks, and these two can be uh, captured with nets or with firearms, and uh, their meat can be sold or eaten and uh, further advance uh, the population of, of Port Said and, and, similar port city, and similar port cities and calling depots. Um, this is compounded by uh, how Port Said and again other calling depots are created by a process of penetration. In Port Said, this is uh, by extending these long wharves into the sea uh, and via a process of solar evaporation, creating new, la new land upon which the depot and the city can be created. One of the byproducts of this is salt, and the salt can be used to salt fish and birds and to sell them. Uh, say to Port Said's um, uh, Mediterranean neighbors, places like Jaffa. Very quickly, uh, you also have other coal burning technologies. In the 1850s, we also, we already have uh, water desalination devices that uh, with the power of coal separate, um, uh, take in seawater and separate water and salt. This creates further salt for the salting. It creates potable or drinkable water for an increasing human population. Uh, and, uh, and interestingly, the desalinated water is also fed to another coal burning device, uh, uh, ice machines. Uh, and the ice that they produce allows now to cool and freeze the meat of fish and birds and to ship it uh, to the Egyptian interior, for example. Uh, so uh, we see uh, a multi-species encounter of, of people and, uh, and pelicans and uh, octopuses and, and fish. But lest we think about this as convivencia, as this kind of multi culti coexistence, I should hasten to add that very quickly we see the emergence of sectarian and intercommunal frames and kinds of politics that seek to tame and reduce this richness and this multiplicity, and these again can be demonstrated with the examples of, of the infrastructures of, of coal. So fishing and bird hunting uh, become a bone of contention because uh, Egyptian subjects are prevented from using firearms and dynamite to shoot at birds or to, to fish, and they can only use rods and nets. Uh, subjects of European councils, uh, councils can use uh, their firearms to, uh, to carry out these tasks. And this splits uh, communities of fishermen and hunters. The land reclaimed from the sea becomes another bone of contention between the Port Said municipality and for foreign councils. Sanated water uh, separate two communities because it turns out that. Uh, that Egyptians and also their animals prefer to stick to their brackish water, whereas the Europeans tend to favor desalinated water. And this recurs in, in other calling depots in Aden, in Kuwait, in Cairo, uh, in many, many places. Uh, and, and I think all these examples, and there are many, many more, um, demonstrate the fact that, um, I mean, Port Said, after all, as I pointed out, has nobody, has nobody native to it in, in 1859, right? It has 150 people, but a few decades later, it becomes the, the example par excellence of a split city, of a city divided to foreigners and locals. Uh, and indeed, these locals, these native Egyptians, like invading species of, of non-human sorts, become indigenized, right? Become entrenched in 
uh, frameworks uh, of, of livelihood and of politics that uh, create or organize the politics in this coal depot in, in sectarian and intercommunal ways. Um, a similar story can be told, uh, can be told about, uh, about Aden. Um, and uh, indeed, Aden is, uh, um, is, a, is a, a boom town in terms of human population. It only has 600 people in 1839 at the eve of the British occupation. Uh, but um, a decade and a half later, it already has 21,000 people and double that in the beginning of the 1890s. And again, like Port Said, it also has an influx of non-human populations. Um, some are very similar to Port Said, some are unique. Um, to give just one example, the Brits are bringing cacti, prickly pear, um, what, uh, what botanists called opuntia, um, to, um, they bring them from the Deccan, from the, the, the Deccan Plateau in the Indian subcontinent, with the, uh, with the uh, design, with the intention of erecting living fences to ward off the attacks of Bedouin tribes. Uh, when this fails, they shift to a strategy of cooptation and, uh, and they begin purchasing the animals of these tribes in order to uh, nourish, to, to provision their, uh, their troops with meat. Um, Aden demonstrates also um, processes that, uh, like Port Said, involve uh, water, frozen and liquid, um, desalinated water. So uh, you have a group of Parsis that accompany the British troops uh, from Bombay and Gujarat, and they bring uh, desalination devices and ice machines. And there's um, a meat sector that develops in Aden, uh, and, and other hobbies. In this picture, we see European women throwing uh, local boys um, Adani and Somali boys to, to dive for in the shark infested bay. Um, so um, I think, uh, I think we, we see in, in both uh, Aden and Port Said um, these phenomena of, of multi species boom towns that organize a political sphere uh, that responds to this multiplicity and, uh, and, and this richness and uh, introduces intercommunal um, frameworks into these economies of lives, uh, human and, and non-human alike. Um, and um, Aden is also a good uh, case in point for the emergence of uh, various kinds of resistance to, uh, the, uh, to the, the, the epistemologies of, of British coal. Uh, so when someone like, uh, like Gandhi uh, passes through the port of, uh, of Aden in the 1880s. This is the moment he becomes a vegetarian. You know, Gandhi experimented in India, but on the steamer, when his fellow travelers try to kind of push him to, um, to eat meat, otherwise he will not withstand the, the difficulties of the passage and he manages to kind of persevere, he is reborn as a vegetarian of a vegetarian of a particular kind, of, a, of, of an anti-imperial or an anti-colonial vegetarian. Uh, Gandhi's thought travels in many languages. Uh, in the 1920s and 30s, it is translated to Arabic and it is engaged uh, by, uh, it is engaged with, say, uh, Gandhi's Book of Health, which is translated uh, as Kitab al uh, and is discovered by Islamic reformers who kick off a, a conversation about vegetarianism, which is quite different from how we in the West think about vegetarianism as a question of lifestyle, of individual choice. For these people, uh, Hindus and Muslims alike, it is more so a question of, of politics, a question of solidarity, a question of coalition building, and a question of kind of, um, of, of, uh, of coalitions between communities. Uh, and I think this is quite a valuable resource uh, for our own um, present today when, um, when experts tell us that uh, carnivority, that, that, that turning vegetarian might be more beneficial to the climate than giving up cars. Um, so uh, just to kind of uh, say a few more, uh, to throw uh, a few more ideas about uh, non-Western um, approaches or, or modes of engagement with these words worlds of, of steam navigation and, and coal. Um, 
these Islamic reformers, I think, um, are, uh, are indexical or, or uh, are emblematic of, of a broader phenomenon um, in, uh, in the 19th century, a moment that, uh, that sees the emergence of the Hajj in the age of steam. The Hajj is completely transformed with the arrival of, uh, of steamships and the shift uh, of, of the Hajj route to the sea. Um, and also the opposite is, is true uh, in the sense that we cannot imagine the establishment of, uh, of infrastructures of steam navigation in the Indian Ocean without the impetus to, uh, to, to visit the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. Um, so much so that in, in the year 1880, uh, we have 5% of the entire uh, global steamer traffic um, in the port of Jeddah, the feeder port to the, to the towns of Mecca and Medina. In other words, the desire to go to Hajj uh, creates a tremendous impetus that allows uh, this process of, of global carbonization. But of course, these pilgrims and the political uh, entities that sanction the Hajj, uh, like, uh, like the Ottomans that, uh, that also develop um, that also develop um, competing infrastructures. Uh, here is one of them, sorry. Uh, the Hijaz Railway, which uses Ottoman coal uh, that is extracted from the, the Ottoman coal coast in Zunguldak, uh, open up uh, an, entire, an entire alternative universe of, of thinking about coal and fossil fuels. Um, so Ottomans, for example, think about coal with the category of rikaz, um, buried treasures that Allah deposits underground for the benefit of the entire community. Uh, they introduce considerations of uh, intergenerational responsibility in the dispensation of this coal or the revenues that, um, that are accrued uh, from its extraction. Uh, in other words, and, and, and this is, I think, uh, a moment to, to, stop, uh, to stop talking, I think what my book puts on the table is a global history of coal that attends to a maritime corridor uh, between Aden and Port Said, which demonstrates how the world is connected with carbon fibers, but in a way that uh, is inflected so that the same chunk of coal animates uh, certain dispositions and perceptions in the British Isles and other dispositions and epistemologies elsewhere. And I think that any engagement, any vision for decarbonization has to take into consideration uh, these historical actors in uh, the colonies, in the Middle East, in the Indian subcontinent, how they think about coal, uh, how they think about um, environmental justice, uh, and, uh, and, and to kind of recycle resources that are, and conversations that are developed in languages that are not only English, that stem out of life experiences that are not only liberal or secular, uh, and that if we want indeed to, um, uh, to carve out a global carbonization uh, that is truly global, we have to attend to all these uh, complex histories. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Ann, for this great um, overview. I think you have uh, given some of the main arguments. But again, I want to stress that there is so much in the book. You know, you can't provide it in 35 minutes here. One of the examples that I found fascinating, you're talking about the um, militarization of meat, uh, how meat uh, consumption was democratized in a way, kind of the lower classes, working classes getting access to it but also uh, it was for the British troops, basically uh, based in Aden, in Somalia uh, and, and uh, other parts of the, of the region. Again, there is really uh, a richness of discussions going on in the, in, in the book. So what I want to do is pose you a few questions that are more um, connect the different sections of the book. You know, also as a historian of energy and particularly oil, one of the things that uh, made me think of was this whole discussion about, you know, how oil and authoritarianism in the Middle East have been uh, two sides of the coin, uh, so, so to speak. Uh, somewhere in the book you write, if energy animated the liberal political and economic dynamics in Europe, this was based on a carbon autocracy and racism elsewhere. 
So because you also show how this was the dynamic even before oil. You know, again, one of the aspects that you have been trying to show that some of these politics are actually rooted in, in coal and, and have been later uh, further developed by, uh, by oil. So can you uh, explain a bit more about the authoritarian uh, part, how these were linked to each other? I will come back later on the racial hierarchies. Sure, yeah, thanks for this question. So uh, uh, here I uh, engage with uh, the thinking and the work of, of one of my mentors, uh, Timothy Mitchell, who in a famous book uh, titled Brilliantly Carbon Democracy, uh, allows us to think of democracy not so much as a history of, of ideas, of an idea that is born in ancient Greece, in the police uh, of, of ancient Greece, but as a story of, of politics, of, of uh, labor struggle, uh, and the way uh, Mitchell tells the story of carbon democracy is that uh, the uh, unprecedented dependence of, of the British economy uh, on coal gives also unprecedented powers of disruption to uh, coal miners that because of the autonomy of people working in small crews underground can uh, sabotage and demobilize an entire system. And they use this power of of strike and, uh, and sabotage to uh, gain access to participatory politics. First, uh, they struggle to uh, expand labor rights, um, um, connecting uh, salaries to, to times of work, uh, reducing the, the work day, uh, fighting for insurance, uh, for, for accident insurance, and gradually also not so much because they're interested in casting uh, votes to a ballot, but, but because they fear that uh, capitalists and, and mine owners would take their um, gains away, they um, insert themselves into the democratic system. They insist on, on a participatory politics uh, that uh, what, what Mitchell argues is closed in the age of oil, because oil has uh, material properties that uh, make it quite different from, from, from coal. But what I discover is that exactly in these decades, these very tumultuous decades, when uh, British miners are striking, we see strikes uh, all over the world. Uh, indeed, the energy sector is truly a global sector, and uh, strikes in, in Virginia and in Newcastle and in Wales uh, radiate to, um, to, of course, the Ruhr Valley, but also to Aden and Port Said and Zunguldak and, and east of the canal uh, via uh, sailors' rumors and, and councillor reports. Uh, and um, many people in this interconnected global system try to speak, uh, to use the language of, of labor rights and to uh, advance towards this horizon of, of participatory politics that uh, the British miners are, are advancing towards. Um, but what uh, eventually happens is that uh, in a global system, uh, indeed, uh, where also the employers are global, right? So you would have uh, mine owners in, uh, in Glen Morgan in Scotland, who is also an operator of, of, uh, of uh, steamer lines uh, in Aden. These global employers would strike deals with their own workers, with British miners, miners and other laborers in the energy sector, coal heavers, stokers, firemen, um, who lose out in the process. So the very success of carbon democracy in the British Isles actually comes at the expense and, and entails foreclosing avenues for participatory politics in the Ottoman Empire. So much so that uh, in these two decades, uh, in, the, in the two opening decades of the 20th century, we have the erosion and the disappearance of the category laborer and employer in, in the Ottoman legal system. Or we have the disappearance of, of uh, ballot systems in, in Port Said uh, that, uh, that is developed in the 1870s. So these kind of nascent uh, democratical protocols and, and possibilities are closed uh, just as they are opened in, uh, in Western Europe. So I think carbon democracy has a darker side, has a kind of, th th this coin has another side, which is carbon autocracy, which the age of oil 
only perpetuates in the region. Well, exactly. And I think uh, another parallel line to, to the process you described is the introduction of racial hierarchies in the, in, in the region. Again, something that has been very much you know, studied when it comes to oil. If you think of uh, Bob Vitale's excellent book on uh, uh, Saudi Kingdom, um, how kind of the, the racial hierarchies in the mine industry uh, in the US were kind of transported as transplanted in Saudi Arabia. Uh, did, so did you find similar processes of uh, racial hierarchization in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire? Oh yes, uh, in the Ottoman Empire and in the Indian Ocean world. Um, we have to understand that um, racial hierarchies are not an offshoot or a byproduct of uh, fossil fuels. They are, um, and uh, they are not unintended, unintended consequences. They are um, essential conditions for the operation of many of these infrastructures. So if, if you think, for example, of steamships, uh, we tend to call steamships uh, an all-weather ship. And indeed, if you compare a steamer to a sailboat, then uh, sailboats depend on the wind and therefore on seasonality. They cannot sail in the monsoon. They have to tack or zigzag. They cannot sail directly uh, in front of the wind. And steamers can do all of that. And in that sense, uh, in the sense of, in one aspect of energy, in, if we think only about kinetic energy and about movement, uh, steamers are indeed all-weather ships. But if we think of heat, and if we think of the movement of steamers in our region, in, in the Mediterranean and, and in the Red Sea, in August, the temperatures in these um, metal uh, vessels in the boiler and engine room can reach 70 degrees Celsius. This is scorching, scorchingly high. Uh, and the way to operate uh, a steamer in these conditions is to recruit peoples that are supposedly heat resistant. Uh, and uh, the British are recruiting people from among the Somali and Adani, brown skinned laborers, stokers and firemen, whom they call human salamanders, right after this mythical creature that lives in the flames of hell. And the way they employ them is uh, they would lock them in the boiler room and in the engine room uh, and, and make them uh, feed the engine with coal until they pass out uh, from heat stroke. Then they would take them away and resuscitate them with, uh, with an ice bath um, that, uh, that is provided by ice from these ice machines, these kind of coal-fired ice machines that I described in Aden and Port Said. And uh, this labor protocol is justified by ship doctors who descend to the, uh, to the boiler room and to the, and to the engine room and experiment themselves uh, with this kind of hard work. Sometimes they lose weight. This is a good the kind of a good way to, to lose weight. Uh, and they develop these racialized um, um, ideas about, about the human body uh, and these ideas about diothermacy, about uh, heat resistance that um, begin to carve out a difference uh, between a universal body that is understood as a steam engine. Uh, Anson Rabinbach writes, uh, Princeton historian writes very elegantly about uh, how thermodynamics organizes our understanding of the human body as a, as a fuel burning machine with the category of, of the calorie. But we have non-universal bodies like these brown skinned workers who have these features like heat resistance uh, and are indispensable for the routine movement of, of steamships. And, and, and so racial hierarchies are, are indispensable for the um, everyday operation of, um, uh, of, of steam navigation in, in the Red Sea. Indeed. Um, I have two final questions. The first is a bit more on the abstract level. Uh, so let me start with that so we can finish with a more um, concrete question. Um, you know, lots of the work that has appeared recently on, on energy uh, takes its cue from Bruno Latour's um, uh, 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 action network theory, for instance, of you know how uh, infrastructures, technologies can be actors in themselves, have agency. Uh, well, 
I, I, I don't want to go very deeply in this discussion because there is lots of literature around this, but what is your take? How have you kind of, because my sense is that you're a bit more fluid with it. You know, you're, you, you look very much into politics and cultures as intermittent steps of how technologies are, you know, spread and how they become functional. So what is, what is your take on this? Yeah, so I, I, I've been more uh, invested uh, in uh, Latourian uh, actor network theory in my previous book. Uh, and in this book, I have an agenda of actually wedding this new materialism, this new mat Latourian materialism and the older Marxian materialism um, that kind of connects the agency of infrastructures and the agency of coal to um, the to constraints and possibilities on, on human agency, on, on labor. Um, so uh, in that sense, you identify correctly that I, uh, I'm less uh, um, zealous uh, about uh, deploying these categories. You could say on a, on a more profound level uh, that I'm trying to probe the thermodynamic um, presuppositions of agency itself, right? Because agency or the ability to work uh, is uh, predicated on these thermodynamic assumptions uh, that uh, translate every uh, manifestation of energy, uh, heat, motion into work, into a particular kind of, of, of agency. So um, you, you could read my book as, as kind of an engagement with uh, a very limited notion of agency uh, for both uh, human and non-human actors. Um, yeah. Oh, excellent. I mean, that's, that's indeed, I think, uh, one of the challenges to take those discussion in that direction of how we can kind of shift this uh, new materialist ideas to bring into labor and, and social dynamics uh, and integrate them. Um, I want to finish with a question um, that is real, more related to our center as well, because a large section of the book uh, obviously covers the Ottoman Empire, uh, but you also uh, going to uh, Northern Africa, uh, you discuss uh, uh, dynamics going on in India, and you also uh, cover some aspects uh, of, of energy in Iran. So as our audience will be very much interested, particularly also in, in what is happening in Iran at the in the time frame that you're describing. So can you elaborate a bit more on what is going on in, in southern Iran, where you know uh, oil is later discovered in early 20th uh, century? Yeah, so my book doesn't engage directly with Iran, but it does engage with the British Empire and with companies like uh, Anglo-Persian oil and in the Persian Gulf, uh, and in particular places uh, that are under Iranian sovereignty like Abadan. Uh, so I think that uh, at least parts of my argument are also uh, applicable for, for this territory and also for Iranian oil, uh, which like other uh, kinds of oil in the region, say Saudi oil, is very much connected to uh, the coal uh, and, and also to other energy sources that, that preceded it. Uh, so just to kind of uh, take one example, I think maybe the example that you alluded to, when uh, in 1926, the uh, oil pipeline to Abadan is, is deployed, what allows the flow of Persian crude, which is uh, very heavy um, among, among crudes, uh, even among crudes, are uh, steam engines and steam compressors that uh, without, without which you do not have a flow of, of oil. And uh, the people and, and actors that deploy these, uh, these pipelines are camel owners that uh, lay down the pipeline in the day and sabotage it at night so that in the next morning they would have a, a livelihood, they would keep their uh, essential status, their, their status as essential workers as we now put it uh, in, in the next day. So I think like in other places, say Pennsylvania or Baku, uh, the um, connection between oil, coal, and animals, that, that is these three um, energy regimes that are usually separated to different eras and to different uh, political systems, 
uh, actually can teach us a great deal about how the oil system is deployed. Uh, so one insight that, that is relevant and that stems from, from that example is the fact that uh, it is exactly the fear of sabotage and the need to co-op these camel owners that explains the spread of the oil system, of oil extraction, of deploying pipelines. Uh, so even if in the long term animal owners orchestrate their own obsolescence, in the short and medium term, they actually uh, make themselves indispensable uh, and insert themselves into, into the oil sector. Uh, so this is just one example that kind of uses Iranian anecdotes to the more general applicability of, of my argument about energy transitions that, that I outlined in the beginning. Thank you, On. Uh, our time is uh, uh, up. There are so many questions, but I really uh, want to advise everybody to just go to your book and, and read it. There is so much in there. Uh, uh, well, uh, you have it with the cover much better. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for accepting our invitation and, uh, well, good luck with your next research and research activities. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Anne.